What's up, my wizards? It's Dev. SBMTG, we like it a magic, you know, by now. And today we're doing a deep dive into War of the Spark Sealed here for your pre-release. Because I want you to be prepared. we got some stuff to go through here. A lot of work went into this one. So if you want to go ahead, hit like. It would actually mean a lot to me. Subscribe for more stuff. Do all the YouTube things. Wanted to go ahead and get that out of the way. Because we have got a lot to discuss. The first thing I want to do is just kind of dip our toe in real easy now and talk about some of the basics of sealed and what to expect from your Watts pre-release. First thing you're going to get is a pre-release pack whenever you pay your fee to the shopkeep. This pre-release pack is going to contain six War of the Spark booster packs, but it's also going to contain one random foil rare or mythic from the set. And this time you'll also get one random planeswalker from the set stamped in foil. It can be uncommon, rare, or mythic rare. Now from the contents of the six packs and the two premium cards, you're expected to construct a 40 card minimum deck. 20 cards less than usual, but you want to stay as close to the minimum as possible. You always play 40 cards because any number above that decreases your chances of drawing your best cards, which is what you want to do at sealed. Get to that big bomb or that best rare or mythic that you were able to get from your packs. So keep that in mind, always stay at the minimum 40 cards. That's going to include about 17 lands in most cases, and don't worry, the shop will in 99% of cases provide those basic lands for you. Now you want to play 17 in most cases, but usually a really aggressive deck, if you're able to get one, can go down to 16 lands. And decks with, say, two or more six drops will occasionally play 18. But for the most part, you're staying at 17, which leaves you about 23 slots for actual cards. Now, Sealed tends to be a slower paced environment. It's definitely looking like that this time around. And it's really more about board presence than anything else. So you're gonna wanna play a fair amount of creatures with respect to a decent curve distribution. For instance, you wanna play more two, three, and four drops than most other kind of creatures. Five drops and six drops are fair game, but you wanna make sure that they're really, really good because that is an awful lot of mana. And you wanna make sure that a lot of your action takes place on the beginning and middle turns of the game. Just one more quick tip for the sealed environment. Make sure that your deck is two colors. Sometimes you can splash a third color, one to three other cards in a third color, as long as you make sure that you're able to get the mana that you need to cast those spells. But very often, you want to stay in the strongest cards you have in two colors. Now, one last quick thing I want to talk about before we get into the real meat of the video, which is going to be my favorite uncommons and commons in the set, for sealed play specifically. I just want to talk about some numbers here that I think are important to the sealed environment, and I want you to keep in mind. The first is 14. There are 14 flying creatures at lower rarities, uncommon and common, in this set, which is far less than usual. Ravnica Allegiance had 17 creatures with flying at lower rarities, plus they had a couple of creatures that could give themselves flying, and there was the afterlife mechanic, which left behind flyers, so a lot of flying in that set, and Guilds of Ravnica had 18 natural flyers, plus again, two more creatures that could give themselves flying. So this is actually 14, far less than usual. That's important to keep in mind for numerous reasons. So flyers are at a premium, but removal isn't necessarily. There are 25 pieces of removal in this limited environment, again, at the lower rarities, uncommon and common, which is a little bit more than usual. Usually we see around 20 pieces, but without stretching our definition of removal too much here, we've got 25 pieces, which is about a tenth of the entire set, which is a lot. Removal is intensely important in Sealed. I've already said that Sealed is a format that mostly focuses around creatures, and so, as that goes, it's also a format that focuses largely around removal in terms of what non-creature spells people play. So, you gotta have removal, and it turns out that there are plenty of options for it this time around. So keep that in mind, too. The lower rarities have a ton of removal this time, more so than usual. Another number I want you to keep in mind here is 16. At the lower rarities, there are 16 creatures with power 4 or greater, and there's a baked-in mechanic in the set that wants your creatures to be that fat. Or bigger. So, just in case you didn't know yet, at the, again, uncommon and common level, there are more, there are more of these at the higher rarities, but just at the uncommon and common level, if you're looking to really enable that mechanic in your sealed deck, there are 16 of those creatures, and you want at least 4 or 5 if you're trying to build around that mechanic. Just a general rule, it's a lot harder to build around a given mechanic in sealed because you have no control over the cards that you receive, unlike a format like Draft, where deck building is a little bit easier, let's just say, to, come, to have archetypes come together. I'm not going to focus too much on archetypes in this video, because it's a lot harder in sealed to guarantee that you'll be able to get a given archetype. Mostly you're just playing the strongest cards in two colors. 
But now let's get into what I really wanted to get into for this video, which is my favorite uncommons and commons in this set at each color. Also gold and artifacts. We'll talk about everything here. I think it's important to talk about uncommons and commons. I know a lot of people are asking already in the comment section, why are you doing this? Really got to keep commons and uncommons in mind during sealed because those are the cards you are most likely to see. Now I'm going to give you my top three uncommons in each color and my top six commons this time around because Wizards has, by their own admission, really juiced the power level of the common slot here, which is only good for us. <laughs> so let's get it started here with the best white uncommons in the set. Four sealed by my estimation here. And you'll notice the Wanderer straight off. A lot Along with Prison Realm and Bond of Discipline. Got something to say about Bond of List Discipline, but we'll get there when we get there. As far as the Wanderer goes, I just want to point out that there are two uncommon Planeswalkers in each color, and I basically picked the one for each color that I think is better for sealed play, although most Planeswalkers are going to be very, very good for sealed play, that goes without saying. The other uncommon Planeswalker, Teo, is also very good in the sealed environment, but I like the Wanderer more because it's going to take out huge bomb creatures your opponent hopes to win the game with. Sometimes this will be a somewhat dead card, I'll admit that much, but it is removal at least twice, not to mention proliferate tricks that can allow you to do it more than that, but it is really good removal <laughs> on a stick at least the two times if it doesn't get attacked into or you protect it well. So, gotta love the Wanderer. This is basically a two for one against your opponent's best creatures some of the time, and it'll even keep your opponent off of things like Chandra's Pyro Helix and other damage base removal in the sealed environment. So keep that in mind too. Wanderer does a lot of good stuff for you. Prison Realm is just really premium removal. It may be uncommon, but that's because it's so good. This takes out all of the permanent types that you really care about in the sealed environment. Planeswalk and creature are going to be the most important things you can seek to do something about and it'll help scry into a fourth land or your big bomb or whatever you're trying to get on the next turn. This is the kind of removal that you always, always want in your deck. As far as Bond of Discipline goes, this is actually slightly controversial. LSV's set review for Limited came out today and he kind of trashed Bond of Discipline saying it's not going to be the overrun you want it to be and all that, but I still think it's a really, really impactful uncommon that's going to end a lot of stalls in Sealed. A lot of games of steel, um, sealed end up you know, turn 12 going to this big board stall if no player was able to establish tempo or advantage or anything like that. So very often you'll be in a situation later on in the game where Bond of Discipline is just an auto win immediately, and it is the overrun you want it to be. Even if it's not going to win you the game immediately, taps down all your opponent's guys, gets in for a consequence-free attack step because you'll gain a bunch of life, which protects you from any crackback you might be worried about. So this can, if it doesn't win the game outright, at least put you on the right footing to win the game on the next turn. I like a lot about this card, and even though it will sit in your hand during the early turns of the game, I would only play one in my sealed deck. Getting multiple copies doesn't sound great, but one copy sounds exactly good enough <laughs> to me because this will end the game a very large percentage of the time in the late game. But let's get to some white commons that I really like. There's Trusted Pegasus, Wanderer Strike, and War Screecher. Now, Trusted Pegasus and War Screecher are some of the only common flyers <laughs> we'll see in the entire set. There are obviously more than this, but flyers at common are just at more of a premium than they usually are, so keep that in mind. But a creature like Trusted Pegasus is a Windrake, a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, that gifts flying to a creature. And again, since flying is at such a premium in this set, this ability is even better than usual, and it's already a good ability. As far as War Screecher goes, this has decent power toughness. It can block Windrake type creatures, of which there are a fair amount, you know, in this format. The creatures that do fly usually don't go too far over, you know, two power at the common and uncommon rarity. So keep that in mind, this blocks pretty well, but if you have enough mana in the late game, then you just get this huge anthem effect on all of your creatures, and again, this can help break board stalls. And just the fact that it flies and it's, you know, coming onto the battlefield at a decent rate in and of itself makes it a creature I've got my eye on. Aside from that, though, there's also Loxodon Sergeant, Law Reinforcer, and Divine Arrow. Divine Arrow is just fine removal. It's the kind of card that you kind of have to point out, and you're a little bit sad that it takes up a slot <laughs> in your best commons, but still, you have to play decent removal. Divine Arrows is definitely that. As far as Law Reinforcer, I love this thing. It can't tap 
other law rune enforcers down, which I think is funny. <laughs> it also can't tap down army tokens. Keep that in mind. That's probably going to be the worst thing about the card in Sealed. Aside from that, though, this is kind of a Maze of Ith. That's a little bit more removable. It just gets rid of your biggest, you know, or opponent's biggest creature in combat every turn. So you don't have to worry about it either attacking into you or blocking against you. So this can be good for defensive decks and aggressive decks alike. And I usually don't care too much for one drops in Sealed, but a creature with the tap down ability, I'm always in for. All in for. As far as Loxodon Sergeant, this isn't super impressive, but I do like it more than a lot of other white commons, and I want to point it out. I wanted to point it out here. Four mana for a 3 3, that's a hill giant. Not the best stats in seal, but will usually take it. As far as bodies go, it's a decent rate. They slap vigilance onto it, making it a little bit more attractive, but the best thing about the card is the ETB vigilance. There's a lot of white cards, if you haven't noticed here, that have really good late game value. Again, if you're in a board stall in the late game and you drop this, this gives you a sort of consequence free attack step. You don't have to sacrifice anything by taking tapping your creatures down, thus leaving them not able to block on the next turn. That's actually a big game, very late in the game, when both players have established boards, and aside from that, you get a 3-3 body out of it too that's up to block when your opponent goes. So, I actually like a lot about this card. I feel like it's a decent value, packed into 4 mana at the common level. I'd look out for it. But let's get into the blue uncommons I think are really good this time around. As far as the Planeswalker, I like Kazmina a lot in the sealed environment and beyond for that matter. But Eternal Skylord and Rescuer Sphinx also look really, really decent to me. Kazmina is just basically a creature factory that can also, you know, function as the card selection, which is good enough in its own right. Creature factory, card selection, all of it's good, but it also puts your opponent off of their removal spells. So just everything the card does is excellent in sealed. So I'll take two bodies for four mana plus some looting, if nothing else. But again, also keeping our opponent off of spells, that is more than worth a four mana rate. This is a fantastic planeswalker in this environment. But Eternal Skylord doesn't look like much, on rate, but it's actually 5 power for 5 mana, which is not bad in its own right, plus 2 of the power flies, plus if you have any other zombie tokens for whatever reason, <laughs> they also fly. It's going to be actually tough to get more than one zombie token in this sealed environment, but not unheard of for that matter, but at the same time, this will at least put two flying power on the battlefield, which doesn't sound great for five mana, but you get a three power body to hold down the ground too. So I really, really like spells and sealed especially. I like creatures that put two bodies on the battlefield and there are an awful lot of them in the sealed environment. Of course, if you already have an army token out or you know an amass token, whatever, then this doesn't actually put a second body on the battlefield, but it will still bring five total power to the battlefield and that's all you're worried about. At a five mana rate and somewhat splashable too, it was a fine card. As far as Rescuer Sphinx, not as splashable, but still a very good card. Flyers again at a premium in this in this in limited, uh, limited environment period. I was going to just say sealed Field, but you know, there's 14 flyers in draft too at the lower rarities so in this limited environment period but this can also refresh a planeswalker send it back to your hand you play it again for renewed loyalty get a couple more abilities off of it that's really good or you just return a creature with an ETB trigger back to your hand all of that is really, really good to get a bigger creature. And by the way, just putting a plus one, plus one counter on pretty much any creature in this sealed environment is a really good ability, more so than usual because we have proliferate in this environment. So if you can get the counter on a Rescuer Sphinx and then proliferate once or twice, then suddenly you've got a huge flying threat on the battlefield and it's not actually too hard to pull this off. Now, Blue has a lot of really good looking commons to me this time around. First, we'll start with Ashiok Skulker, Avon Eternal, and Erratic Visionary. All of these look really, really good to me. Ashiok Skulker has a sort of mana sinky type ability, protects you from flood in the late game. You're always looking to use your mana as efficiently as possible. And on turn six, seven, eight, if you have no better way of using your mana, it's always nice to be able to make Skulker unblockable and just eventually take the game that way. But on rate for five mana, this actually has a pretty good toughness, so it can also hold down the ground for you while you need to until you can get in a position where you can actually start swinging with it. I think it's going to be one of the most important blue commons in Sealed. Let me just put it that way. I think it's a very good card, but even Eternal is really good. This is actually better on raid in a lot of ways than Eternal Skylord. This is three mana for three power, two of which flies. And that is actually quite good. Again, this is a Windrape type creature. It's a three mana, two, two flyer by itself. Fine rate in sealed. You want that most days, but this brings a whole other body and a whole other power toughness onto the battlefield. So that's just really, really good. Again, 
Sealed is very much about board presence. So these things that bring, you know, a zombie onto the battlefield with them when they interplay are really, really nice. Not only will they help you play around with the mass mechanic and the, the uh, proliferate mechanic, but this is just extra bodies on the battlefield helping you extend your advantage. And this is just a really, really fine common. You're going to play Windrakes anyway. Why not play Windrakes that also put extra power on the ground? So yes to that, but Erratic, erratic Visionary. Yet another really good mana sink. This one for just two mana. You get a looter that has respectable toughness for just a couple of mana. Two mana gets you three toughness. That blocks on the ground all day against aggressive decks for what that's worth. But in the mid and late game, suddenly you're just changing out bad cards for good cards. Looting is really good on a stick and sealed. And I expect this to, to also be one of the most important blue commons. And maybe, possibly one of the most important commons in the set for sealed period. Having this thing on a stick looting for you every single turn is going to be a huge advantage for the decks that have it. But three other blue commons to look out for are Thunder Drake, Spellkeeper Weird, and Callous Dismissal, which I was a little bit wary about at first, but even despite the sorcery speed, I think this is a fine card. Not usually a huge fan of bounce effects in sealed, but considering that armies are such a consideration in this sealed environment, this is just going to kill an opposing army a lot of the time. Even if you're just, you know, returning something to your opponent's hand, uh, so you can get through for a turn and put a body out on the battlefield. This seems like really good value. Seems like fantastic tempo in the mid game. So I am a fan of this card, although I don't think it's one of the absolute most amazing blue commons. I do still want to point it out because I think it's important enough. Now, Thunder Drake and Spellkeeper Weird are both in this category of you have to be playing a lot of spells in your deck to really make them work. Although Spellkeeper Weird, not so much. You know, this can just return a removal spell to your hand. You're bound to be playing removal in your deck. Just return a removal spell to your hand when it's going to die in combat anyway. So, and it's got a really respectable four toughness for the three mana. That's very nice. It's going to block on the ground for a large percentage of the game and stay alive. And then, by the time, you know, it's really, really relevant for you to get a removal spell back, Bing bong. There you go. So I really like Spellkeeper Weird. If it didn't have four toughness, I wouldn't be as into it. But considering it does block so well until you do want to change it in, I do like the card a lot. It's really, really good on the ground, and it's always going to get the removal spell back that you want. As far as Thunder Drake, a little bit more difficult to enable, but I do imagine that if you just cast two spells in a turn even once, then the card is probably a really, really good raid. At that point, you have a 3-4 flyer that costs you four mana initially, and that is a really good good rate but of course any more than that and suddenly you've got this huge threat too that actually might not be as hard to enable as it looks like if you can actually get this on curve you can probably cast two spells on the next two turns if you've got things lined up right especially if you've got the you know required number of you know instants and sorceries and such that are low rate but this doesn't actually require that you cast instants and sorceries, just spells, period. So even if you're able to play two creatures in a row, it'll still get a counter on it. Remember that. So I think Thunder Drake is just a decent on-rate flyer to begin with that you're probably going to jam into your limited deck. But if you can just get one counter on it and then again, proliferate that counter, you don't even have to play extra spells after that. You know, imagine a turn where you play two spells and one of those spells proliferates. Well, suddenly Thunder Drake is enormous. So keep this card in mind, too. Well, let's take a look at the black uncommons that I like in this set real quick. There's Obnix Silas. I think he's the better Planeswalker of the uncommon Planeswalkers this time around. But there's also Bleeding Edge and Eternal Taskmaster. Really like it at uncommon. As far as Obnix, I think this is a little bit better than Davriel because it's just removal on a stick. It does draw your opponent cards, but for what it's worth, it also deals them damage when it draws them cards. And it just functions as an underworld dream. Sits there on the battlefield and punishes them for drawing cards in the first place. So this is kind of a clock they have to get around somehow. If this only kills one creature, again, yeah, it'll make your opponent draw cards, but sometimes you'll much rather get the big creature off the battlefield that you know for a fact is going to kill you and trade it in for two of your opponent's cards. You know, let them have two cards. Who cares? Just don't kill me with that thing. So removal on a stick is pretty much always good. You get to use this one twice at the very least, and after you're done using it, again, it sits there and continues dealing damage to the opponent. I think Obnix is a pretty fine uncommon if you're looking for good uncommons. As far as Bleeding Edge goes, easily one of the best uncommons 
tokens in the entire set, as far as I'm concerned. If you don't have any other army tokens on the battlefield, this is just a straight up two for one that's almost always going to kill something in the early to mid game and give you a body, which is just incredible. It's kind of a ravenous chupacabra, necrotal, shriek maw kind of effect, <laughs> whatever creature you want to compare it to. You know, this isn't technically a creature, but it's basically a three mana two two body that kills something when it comes into play a vast majority of the time. Keep this card in mind because it's going to help you advance your board state while also destroying your opponent's creatures, which is exactly what you want to be doing in a sealed environment full of planeswalkers. Eternal Taskmaster, that statement applies to it as well, you know. You want to be able to be resilient and get your creatures back so that they can continue attacking your opponent and their planeswalkers too. You want to get those off the battlefield. So creatures are going to be even more important in this sealed environment than usual because we want to be able to kill planeswalkers as well. So you want your creatures, you want to be resilient. This is going to be a very important element for black decks to keep creatures on the board. Even if this only ever attacks once and then dies in combat, it's still going to cash in for a creature and that's going to be able to, you know, basically it just replaces itself if it dies in combat. And if it ever attacks more than once and gets you more than one creature back, it's just an unbelievable engine in formats beyond sealed, but sealed especially. Now, some black commons that I really, really like, and there are more than a few this time around, are Dusk Mantle Operative, excuse me, Shriek Diver, and Lazatep Reaver. Dusk Mantle Operative might be one of my favorite black commons, period. You know, a bear with this much upside? pretty good. There are a lot of big creatures in this format. As a matter of fact, again, there's a whole mechanic based around big creatures in this set that people are going to be trying to enable. So Dust Mantle Operative is going to go unblocked some of the time, especially if you can kill your opponent's smaller creatures. And if you can somehow make Operative's power, you know, four, five, six, and suddenly your opponent can only chump block it. They cannot trade with it in combat at that point. So you get a counter on it, and then you proliferate or something, and suddenly this thing gets big enough to be a real beast in combat can take a game over by itself. That's what you want in a two-mana play. As far as Shriek Diver, this is almost a win, Drake. It doesn't have the two toughness, but we'll still take it because we can give it haste in the late game. That means it's a much better top deck than your average win, Drake, because if you rip this off the top of your library on turn 20 or whatever, you know, we'll just say turn 9 to be a little bit more realistic, then suddenly it can immediately attack, which is actually really, really good value. I like Shriek Diver at common a lot. And also Lazatep Reaver, you know? This is another creature that puts two bodies on the battlefield, and it very often will if you get it on curve. This only costs two mana, and it's a good way to start your army in the early game while also expanding your board state, giving you two blockers or a way to get aggressive on the next turn, if that's what you want to do by using combat tricks and pump spells or anthem effects. It's just a really good way to start developing your board in the early game that's also not dead in the late game. But there are definitely more black commons than that to talk about. We gotta talk about Obnixilis' Cruelty and Soren's Thirst, because you gotta point out their removal. But also Vraska's Finisher, because you gotta point out their removal. You know, post combat, you'll play a finisher and you'll just finish something off. The name is very apropos, you know, you'll kill a creature and get a body on the battlefield, which again, two for ones are always, always good and sealed in pretty much any format, they're good. But since these kind of two for ones are gonna be especially important in this environment, we were trying to sort of gain a advantage over an opponent with a board with planeswalkers, you know, or maybe you both have planeswalkers that you're trying to protect, keep protected, not have attacked into. So these kind of swingy two-for-ones are going to be super important in the sealed environment. Keep them in mind. But as far as Soren's Thirst and Obnixilis' Cruelty, these are just straight up very good on-rate removal spells. Soren's Thirst is going to kill an awful lot of stuff in the early game, and it's a little bit tough to cast in the early game. But even on turn four, five, six, this is going to kill an awful lot of creatures to help clean up what your opponent did in the early game, catch you back up in life. It's always a playable card. As far as Obnixilis' Cruelty, this is one of the best common pieces of removal, if not the best, in the entire set. This is going to kill a vast majority of creatures in this environment, and it's going to exile them as well, so that can be important. Again, we just saw Eternal Taskmaster, and there are plenty of other ways to get cards back from your graveyards. The Exile Clause is not just extra text on this card. It can be important in this environment. Now, in terms of red uncommons in the set, I think there's a lot of juice at the uncommon level, but not quite the common level in red. We'll talk about it. As far as the uncommons I want to look for, I like Jaya, although it was tough to pick the better red uncommon planeswalker. I like Tybalt too, mostly because he's a creature factory. Tybalt looks very good to me, but I like Jaya a little bit more, but 
At the same time, I also like Chandra's Triumph and Cyclops Electromancer in the uncommon slot. As far as Jaya goes, one quick more, you know, one more quick word on this. Just having two shocks is really, really good. Plus, this allows your other red removal spells to do a little bit more damage, your creatures to do more damage in combat. There's an awful lot that I like about Jaya for just five mana. It seems like a pretty high rate, but getting double shock is always good. Plus, the extra gravy on top is, again, not extra text. You will use this text an awful lot. Jaya seems like a great card to me, although, again, the Red Gun Common Planeswalkers are both very good this time around. Keep that in mind. As far as Chandra's Triumph, a lot of the Triumphs are good. You may have noticed I didn't talk about Liliana's or Gideon's Triumph. It's because I think there are just better removal spells in those colors than those cards. You want to play the other Triumphs that are removal? Yes, you do want to put those in your deck. Didn't mean to imply that you don't because they are removal. And you always play removal. But as far as removal spells, I think this is the best Triumph. So keep that in mind. But as far as Electro, this is the Cyclops Electromancer looks so boss to me. It doesn't have the best toughness, which is the only thing keeping me off of the card at all. But it is a lot of the time going to be a removal spell by the time you can actually play it. Turn five, six, seven, whenever you get your fifth land drop, you'll often have enough to shock something when it enters the battlefield. But if you have enough to bolt something, deal three damage then this just always, pretty much no questions asked, kills something. As a general rule, again, I like bodies that kill creatures. They're just the best cards in sealed a lot of the time, and Electromancer is no exception to that rule. If you can get this to kill something and put a four-power body on the battlefield, which again enables all of those, you know, mechanics that make you have a creature with power four or greater. Card does that too. So there's just a lot going for it, whether you're playing the spells deck or the creatures power four or more deck, you know. And Electromancer is probably going to slot into either one of those. Now, as far as some red commons that I really like, here's Jaya's Greeting, Heartfire, and Chain Whip Cyclops. Now, Heartfire is just decent removal. This does require that you sacrifice something, but... That said, sometimes you'll have a Planeswalker on one loyalty that's not doing much for you. You'll just sacrifice that to kill something. Or you get a creature that's going out as a result of combat. Anyway, it's going to die, so you just sacrifice it. Kill something with hard fire, you know. And this is going to kill a lot of big creatures. You can cash in small creatures to kill big creatures. And usually I don't like stuff like this in Seal that requires you to come down a body, basically two for one yourself. But considering this is instant speed, there's going to be a lot of game situations where you don't necessarily have to effectively two for one yourself in order to cast the card and it kills 90% of the creatures in the environment so it's decent playable removal I've got my eye on but so is Jaya's Greeting which is actually a better card this is just targeted bolt to a creature for three mana it's kind of lightning strike that can only target creatures but that's okay because the scry is going to help you get your third or fourth land, you know, your big bomb, whatever. Scrying is always really good in formats that only have 40 cards. It's even better than usual, you know. It's, it's one third better than usual. <laughs> so I really like the scry on this card, but obviously you play it because it's a removal. And I don't really have to explain it <laughs> much more than that. If I like Chandra's Triumph, I like Jaya's Greeting. As far as other commons that I'm looking at, though, I really like this Chain Whip Cyclops. Because, again, it enables the powerful or greater mechanic and it's a mana sink. You know, if you need to protect from flood a little bit or just use your mana effectively, keeping creatures from blocking, always good and you get a pretty creature, a pretty good creature on rate. For that matter too, this is one of the better red common creatures. Even at a fairly high mana cost, I still like a lot of what this card can end up doing for you. But some other red uncommons, or commons, excuse me, are Oncrop Invader, Spellgorger Weird, and even Raging Crunch, which was tough. It was really tough to pick a last red common I wanted to talk about, but Raging Crunch is so above rate that I really like it, whether you're using it defensively or aggressively. Know that this doesn't have to have, you know, another creature blocking to block, so very often you can trade up. You only, you know, paid three mana for your Raging Crunch, but this is going to very often kill, you know, four and five drop creatures, so even if you're playing defensively, really easy to trade up when you've got, when you've got a Raging Crunch out. But if it is aggressive, you know, in an aggressive deck where you def you're guaranteed to have another creature attacking with it, it's super above rate there, too. I like three mana three threes in sealed, so a three mana four three is just off the rails, you know? I usually like creatures that actually do stuff. I don't like vanilla creatures, and I even less like creatures that, you know, are vanilla and have a drawback, <laughs> for what it's worth. But just as far as the rate goes, I think this is a really good creature that, you know, the value on it goes through the roof in aggressive decks. So keep Raging Crunch in mind, but on crop invader 
actually looks really attractive to me. Three mana for an effective first strike on a two power creature is actually at least okay. You know, this is going to attack really, really well, and it functions as a sort of arcbound ravager, you know, or an antuko husk. You can, there's this huge threat of activation on this creature, and obviously it goes really well in any sort of aristocrats type build. Maybe you've got mayhem devil or something, and you're trying to make sacrificing creatures in your sealed deck a thing. There are a lot of ways you can synergize with this. We've got some eternal taskmaster, a couple of other ways to get creatures back from your graveyard. So this does have some sideways synergy with other cards, but mostly the threat of activation is where it's at. If this goes unblocked, then suddenly it can deal six, eight damage all at one time to your opponent. They don't want that, so they're forced to block it. But if they block it, you can just sacrifice a creature that's going to die elsewhere in combat anyway, and suddenly you have a four power invader that's going to kill pretty much anything that blocks it most of the time. So I think Oncrop, Inv yeah, Oncrop Invader just has a lot of threat of activation and a lot of different combat scenarios in which it attacks really, really well into a board full of creatures or an empty board for that matter. So I like a lot about this card, a lot of action at the common level. As far as Spell Gorger Weird, usually I'd be off this card because it takes a lot to enable this, but in this case, it doesn't. It's a prowess creature that, you know, keeps the counters. So it's not just one turn of value at a time. The worst thing about Prowess and Sealed is that, you know, oh yeah, you might have a three power flyer for one turn. Then you have a one power flyer every other turn. In this case, you get your spell gorger down and yeah, you got a scathe zombies. Next turn, you cast a spell. You got a three, three for your three mana investment. Next turn, you cast a spell. It's a four, four. You know, if on any of those turns, you're able to double spell. Suddenly you got a five, five or a six, six. This thing just can get out of control if it's not dealt with. With. So I really, really like this thing a lot, actually. Again, usually I'm a little cold to prowess, but this is the kind of prowess that it just gets to keep as the game goes on, and then it works with proliferate, too. There's an awful lot to like about Spell Warrior. This is a really good card. But let's go to Big Green and check out the uncommons that I want you to look out for. There's Arlen, Voice of the Pack, Challenger Troll, and Evolution Sage, which I was a little bit wary of, honestly, but as to, in terms of proliferate tricks in this set, Green's got most of the really, really good ones, and this is no exception, you know, you're going to be playing lands. In every single Magic deck, it is pretty much guaranteed that you're going to play lands, so if this proliferates twice for you, it's just golden. If you've got a Planeswalker or two out, this proliferates, that's amazing. If you've got any creatures with plus one, plus one counters on them, and I've already discussed a bunch in this video in other colors, not just green, then this just gets you so much advantage relatively quickly and is at least a serviceable body for the mana cost too. 3-2 three, for 3 isn't the, exactly where you want to be, but it's going to trade in combat most of the time, and that's okay when it needs to be okay. But for the most part, if this proliferates twice, it's just unbelievable and one of the best uncommons in the set. If you're drafting, pretty easy to draft up a proliferate deck that focuses on this as an engine, but if you get it in sealed, remember, it's usually going to bring you some value. So it's worth playing because the body is at least okay to begin with. As far as Challenger Troll, the body is insane to begin with. You know, a 5 mana 6-5 is very, very good, and this is maybe one of the better payoffs for having a creature power 4 or greater um, in the entire limited environment. I just think Challenger Troll is insane at the uncommon level because the body for the raid is good enough, but the extra gravy is beautiful too, and it benefits more than just itself. As far as Arlen goes, this is my Planeswalker of choice for the uncommon slot in green because it's a creature factory and the other one is not. The other one, Yang Wang Yu, is a um, plus one plus one counter factory, which can be very good in terms of proliferate tricks and there are plenty in green to go off of, but I think there's a lot more value in this set for Arlen because it's going to create a bunch of three threes over time for you, and if you can proliferate, it's going to create a lot, a lot of three threes for you over time, and that kind of creature factory, even at six mana, is very desirable and sealed. Now there are a lot of good green commons. It was really hard to pick six that I really, really liked above all the other ones, but I do like Bloom Hulk, Band Together, and Vivian's Grizzly. Now, Band Together is just playable removal at instant speed. Even though it's a three mana rate, seems a little bit high, it's still going to be, you know, insane most of the time. I love this fight mechanic where the creatures don't get to hit back and kind of a sucker punch mechanic, <laughs> you know? It's a great way for to, to flex removal in green, so you'll play this card pretty much every time you get it, but I'll say the same thing about Bloom Hulk 
Hulk and Vivian's Grizzly. Vivian's Grizzly, actually both of these cards seem like they should have been uncommons and got placed into the common slot. Bloom Hulk is a great rate. Four mana, four, four is where you want to be anyway. But if you get, you know, an extra two or three power off of this due to proliferating counters or an extra loyalty counter on a Planeswalker, then you just made the four mana rate insane for what you're actually getting, you know. But same thing with Vivian's Grizzly. This could have easily been an uncommon. The stats are at least okay. Three mana, two, three is not anything to write home about, but it's serviceable. What I like about this is the activated ability, because it effectively draws cards occasionally. Sometimes it will whiff, so I don't want this card to be a trap, but if you have the requisite number of creatures in your sealed deck, this will very often draw you a card at the end of your opponent's turn, or say, when they go to target Vivian's Grizzly with a removal spell, you try to get a card out of it, basically, you know. It's just, you know, any green card advantage engine is going to be worth playing, so definitely keep an eye on Viv's Grizzly. This card looks insane at the common level. I just don't, I don't get how it's printed at common. Aside from that, though, this is, you know, a factor of it being tough to figure out what cards I want to point out at common and green, because there are a lot more than these last three. I like Crunch Wrangler, for example, but anyway, there's also Pollen Bright Druid, Centaur Nurturer, and Thundering Ceratok, which is crazy on rate, too. Five mana is getting a little bit expensive for a creature in sealed, but it's still a 4-5 trample body that can break the game wide open if it comes down late. You know, if you top deck this on turn 9 or 10, you're in the middle of a stalemate, this will sometimes end the game on the spot. And if it doesn't, it still leaves you up with a 5 toughness body to block that also attacks really, really well in the next turn. Very threatening card here with a great ETB trigger. I like Thundering Ceratok a lot, and it's another card I'm a little bit surprised is at the common level in this set. Now, Centaur Nurture has a lot packed onto it, too. I don't mind 4 mana 2 fours in seal. They're a little bit boring, but it's at least a somewhat decent rate if you're looking for a blocker. But this blocks plus more, you know? It gets you 3 life to catch you back up against aggro, which is always welcome. Plus, it helps you splash. And if you got a third color splash, this is going to help you both ramp and get that extra color that you're looking to get. Or maybe just get double colors of, of one of the two primary colors that you're playing. So, this just does everything. You know, life, ramp, mana fixing decent toughness if you're not looking for any of those other things so Centaur Nurture is just so much value packed onto one body I think it's a slam dunk playable but Pollen Bright Druid a little bit tougher to say you know this can just be a bear with upside sort of if you actually if you play it as a bear two minutes to do it doesn't actually have any upside other than it's a creature you can further proliferate, which is sometimes worth it in and of itself. But if you're just putting another, you know, a counter on a creature to proliferate that creature further, that's nice. Or maybe you're just proliferating, period, and you're putting counters on two or three creatures, plus a loyalty counter on a Planeswalker. You're effectively getting, like, three power out of this two-drop creature. That's all really good. Just so much flexibility, so much versatility. It's good late. If you can proliferate a board that you really want to proliferate, with like four different things to proliferate, it's a great card to top deck late. But it's also a fine drop early because it facilitates itself, allows for further facilitation of later proliferates and stuff. Just a lot going on with Pollen Bride Druid. I like the card a lot at pretty much any point of the game. Now, we're not quite done here. I want to go over some gold things that are important to point out and some artifacts before we get out of here and finish things up. Now, as far as gold cards, there are a bunch of gold planeswalkers. There are 10, but I'm going to whittle it down to five that I think are the best in this set that you want to keep an eye out for. All of these uncommon gold planeswalkers are insane, can change the complexion of a game for you. There's Dovin. Kaya and Nahiri. All of these are basically removal on a stick, except that Dovin also keeps your opponent off of playing their other their removal spells, which is very good in and of itself, but it acts as a maze of ith in the meantime for a few turns. And that's really, really good too. Kaya is just straight up removal on a stick you can activate at least twice. And that's pretty sweet as well. And, you know, if, they're, if they happen to have, like, Ward Scale Crocodile, the Hexproof thing in the set at the common level in green, then you can always just turn off their Hexproof. That might be an important interaction in Sealed. As far as Nahiri, this too, just an assassin. Just kills, you know, tap-down creatures, which can be really good in both aggressive and defensive decks. Much better in defensive decks for the most part, but... You know, you want to be able to blow away blockers. That's why it's not as good in aggressive decks. But it can still blow away stuff to keep your opponent off of board position, all that. Any removal on a stick is good. 
All of these Planeswalkers are exactly that. Aside from that, though, there's Vraska and Angrath. Keep an eye out for these two because instead of being creature removal, these are creature factories at the uncommon level that are also very good. Vraska creates Death Touchers, and Death Touchers in Sealed are nuts. They're just bananas in most cases, and this produces multiple Death Touchers that can get bigger and then benefit from proliferate later on in the game. It's just crazy the things Vraska can do if she's not kept in check. But same thing with Angrath. This basically gives all of your creatures menace, which is good outside of just the tokens it's creating, but it can create two tokens over the course of a game if the first token dies, or it can just create a 4-4 four, four for a price of four mana that has, you know, menace. <laughs> it's, it's, all of that is really good on rate, so there's just so much to like about both of these walkers. Creature factories are good, as well as removal planes walkers. Keep those things in mind, but for the most part, I just, I love these uh, so much. Making Death Touchers is crazy, and giving all your creatures minutes can just crack the entire game wide open, so look out for both of these. Now there are six gold removal spells at lower rarities that I want you to keep an eye out for. These are Angrass Rampage, Death Sprout, D Spark, and Tyrant Scorn. Just to get started here, there's two more, but I don't have to tell you how good any of these cards are. You know, D Spark is only going to be good against bigger creatures for the most part. Tyrant Scorn only good against smaller creatures, but they both definitely have their plays. Angrass Rampage may not be targeted, but it's usually going to kill a Planeswalker if that's what you want to kill that's almost targeted, because they're not usually going to have more than one Planeswalker out. Sometimes they will, but not often. Aside from that, though, this does get a creature off your opponent's side of the table, which can be important as well. As far as Death Sprout goes, this is ramp and removal, even though it's a little bit difficult to cast and it's pretty high on rate. It's still definitely a card you want to be playing if you're in the proper colors. As far as the other removal spells to look out for, there's Rao's Outburst and Domri's Ambush. Domri's Ambush is insane. It does require a creature to, you know, enable it, but it's still some of the best fight mechanic removal that we've pretty much ever seen. So even though it does take two colors to cast and a creature to enable, it's still great removal that, you know, puts counters on creatures, which is always something you want to be doing in any sealed environment, but especially this one. Now the proliferate factor is so heavy into what we're trying to do. As far as Rao's Outburst though, this replaces itself in your hand and kills something 90% of the time. Those are both things you want to be doing. I know four mana seems like a high rate, but this kind of card advantage is where you want to be. Now there are three gold creatures I want you to keep an eye out for at the lower rarities. Those are Elite Guard Mage, Leyline Prowler, and Merfolk Skydiver. Now I'm not sure that either that any of these would put me in this color combination, but especially Elite Guard Mage probably would heavily pull me in that direction. You know, I might want to play Azorius just to play Sky uh, Skyguard, or excuse me, Elite Guard Mage, just because this is crazy under the battlefield trigger. Um, flying's at a premium too. It's a decent body, not exactly where you want to be, but a decent body for the rate. If you can get a counter on it, start proliferating. There's just no end to the value you can get off of this. Drawing a card and gaining the life is great. This is one of the best uncommons in the set, by my estimation. But same thing with Leyline Prowler. You know, Death Touch, I've already talked about, is crazy and sealed. But this is also decent body. It's got Life Link, which is a great ability in any format. Again, sealed especially. And it can fix your mana, ramp you, all that, all on three, you know, for three mana on one card. It's just a crazy raid, so keep your eye out for Prowler too, but Merfolk Skydiver wouldn't necessarily put me directly in Simic, but this does so much, you know, heck, it might put me directly in Simic. Having Proliferate on a stick for the late game is just crazy, I shouldn't have to tell you that, just, you know, a, a Flood Protector um, that just acts as a mana sink, gives you something to do with your mana in the late game, and the thing it gives you to do with your mana is crazy, especially if you have have planeswalkers out you can get them to ultimate really fast it's just an unbelievable card plus it puts at least a 2-2 flyer out that benefits from later proliferate strats so just merfolk skydiver is insane and there's a lot more to this card than there appears to be at face value aside from that though there's kind of some other just gold stuff to keep an eye out for two of which are creatures there's a gleaming overseer that i want you to keep a keep one out for plus watley's raptor and um pride of unity now or excuse me um pledge of unity i always want to call it pride of unity but Pledge of Unity can just be game-breaking in the late game. Plus, it puts counters on everything. So even if you don't plan on winning that turn, you can still start proliferating after that, and just all of your creatures benefit from it. And that's crazy, but this can also be played as effectively a combat trick. So there's a lot of spread of use on this card, a lot of versatility. Keep it in mind. I think it's worth the one of in your sealed deck if you're in green-white. As far as Watley's Raptor, I could say the exact same thing, except it's worth as many copies as you get. It's just above rate. A 2-mana two 2-3 two, is great, plus Vigilance stamped onto the 
the card, plus ETB proliferate. Like, what else do you want? This card is really, really above rate. And again, it's good in the early game just because it's above rate. Play it on turn two, you won't get too much proliferate action, but it's still a good body for the cost. But if you rip it on turn 10 and sealed, it's going to usually bring, you know, four power to the battlefield, plus maybe a loyalty counter on a planeswalker. For a two mana investment, that's insane. <laughs> plus, this is really good on defense or offense in the early game, too. So a lot to like about Raptor. And Gleaming Overseer puts two bodies on the battlefield some of the time, but it's got a huge toughness by itself. And it maybe gives you, you know, your army tokens the best spread of abilities. <laughs> you know, both Hexproof and Menace gives two abilities, which most of these give your zombie creature tokens an ability. Most of them only bestow one ability. This gives you two really good ones. Menace is a form of evasion, and Hexproof is maybe the best ability in all of magic. Not just sealed magic, but sealed especially again. And finally, some artifacts to look out for. We've got Guild Globe, Mana Geode, and Prismite. Now, there's not a whole lot of mana fixing in this environment, and it is very likely you will want to splash a third color um, in this, particularly in this environment. There's a pretty good spread of gold cards to play, so it's likely you are going to splash a third color. You're going to need some fixing, and these are some of the best that we get. Guild Globe does sacrifice to fix, which kind of sucks, but when you just need to cast that one spell, it's going to be really, really good. Um, plus, it draws you the card when it nears the battlefield, which is one of the best things we can do in any game of Magic, in any format. So keep that in mind. But Mana Geode is going to fix your mana and ramp you for the rest of the game, as well as Scry to help you find your big bomb or your next land or whatever. So Mana Geode is actually playable, I think, as a one-of in the sealed environment if you're trying to splash a third color. Same thing with Prismite. This is just a fine body, a two-mana, two-power body, you're going to be playing that to fill out your curve anyway, but this helps you fix your mana by just funneling two colors of mana into whatever color of mana that you want. So this is just an extremely playable card, and all of these are at the common level, and I might like Prismite the most, but I'd put any of them into my sealed deck. Whew, so that was probably a pretty long video, and if you've stuck all the way through, I really appreciate it. I just want to help you as much as I possibly can. Uh, to win your pre-release, or at least do well, get some packs, have a good first pre-release, or a good... 30th pre-release, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever you're doing. I'm just trying to help you out as much as I can, do a deep dive on the set, you know, all that. Tell you what's good, what's not, give you some numbers, blah, blah, blah. So if you're still here, really appreciate that. If you haven't done it yet, like the video, blah, blah, subscribe, because we're now into the point of the season where we get into the real big stuff. You know, we've got the best sleepers in the set, the top at least 25 cards in the set coming up after that, and then deck techs. In case you haven't noticed, in case you, you haven't noticed, in case you didn't know yet, we're already doing the polls on Patreon um, to determine what the first deck of the season is, and beyond that, actually. I just posted 20 decks to vote on on Patreon, so if you're not a patron yet, just throw a dollar into the Patreon pot, link in the description, and you can vote on what decks you want to see first in this upcoming season. So get in there, there's a bunch of decks to vote on, you still have 24 hours in the next vote. Um, by the time this video goes up, it'll be about 24 hours. But then after that, you're going to have another vote, another vote, another vote. So keep that in mind. If you're not a Patreon yet, patron yet, get in there, hit the link, do all the things. But you can also go over to TCG Player if you want to. They help sponsor your boy, keep the lights on around here and all that. You can pre-order stuff from them still at lower than what would normally be MSRP if Wizards hadn't magically decided MSRP doesn't exist. So get over there. You can still pre-order boxes at less than 100 bucks, Or you can use them as a price guide, however you want to use your TCOG player. You do it, you do you, boo. But aside from that, I'm pretty sure I'm done wasting everybody's time now. I mean, at this point, you've already been here for like 40 minutes, so you don't want to hear me run my fat mouth. Just do all the YouTube things, help me out as much as you can at, the, you know, at your activity level. If all you do is hit like, I'm happy for you there. But again, if all you've done is watch all the way through this video to this point, I'm pretty happy to have you too. So, you know, whoever you are, my wizard, good to have you. But I guess I'm done for now. You know, just make sure you subscribe for more content. Follow me on Twitter at SBMTGDev, and I will catch you cats later. I am Dev from the place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.